Uh, Jeremy Orr, our senior fellow, is the Director of Litigation and Advocacy Partnerships at Earth Justice. And Earth Justice is a leading uh, nonprofit public interest environmental law organization. Um, as its website explains, Earth Justice, quote, wields the power of law and the strength of partnership to protect people's health, to preserve magnificent places and wildlife, to advance clean energy and to combat climate change. In his role as Director of Litigation and Advocacy Partnerships, Jeremy helps Earth Justice's offices, programs and departments build strategies to deeply engage and genuinely partner with communities and other stakeholders. Prior to joining Earth Justice, Jeremy served as a senior attorney with the Natural Resources Defense Council, uh, with, with which I hope you're all familiar where he focused on drinking water and source water protection issues, working to ensure that all people have access to safe, sufficient, and affordable drinking water. Immediately before that, he worked for People's Climate Movement as the director of state programs, building and mobilizing coalitions across more than 20 states in pursuit of climate justice. He has a background in community organizing and community lawyering. He's also served as the director of organizing for interfaith worker justice, and as an environmental justice attorney for the Transnational Environmental Law Clinic, the executive director of the Michigan Environmental Justice Coalition, and a lead community organizer with the Gamaliel Foundation. He was a former two-sport collegiate student athlete in football and track. What position? Football? Wide receiver. Wide receiver. Oh, you know, we need one, actually. <laughs> if you're looking for work, <laughs> I can hook you up. Uh, Jeremy earned his BS, MS, and law degree from Michigan State University. Please give him a warm welcome. We're thrilled to have him here. Thank you. Thank you, Dan, for the for the great introduction. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, you know, thank you all for being here uh, in uh, in person and, and those of us joining us online. Uh, uh, and thank you to the Rappaport Center for inviting me to be uh, you know, a senior fellow in residence this year. Uh, with a very special thank you to uh, Lizzie and, and Cindy for all your efforts in uh, getting me here uh, you know, this year. I, I, I thoroughly appreciate it. Uh, you know, I'd say that to have myself uh, as a senior fellow, uh, you know, someone who's uh, spent much of their uh, public facing career kind of lifting up and addressing issues of uh, environmental injustice, particularly at the intersection of of race and class, which often tends to create um, uh, tension and discomfort, right? It feels uh, pretty significant to be here uh, talking about this today. Uh, you know, and, and I'll say it feels significant because it's it's easy to leave the work of justice uh, outside of academia, right? Um, you know, along with all the other kind of tough and uncomfortable topics that we deal with in the world every day. Um, and, you know, that we often want to leave outside of the four walls of these, these types of classrooms. Uh, right, because that's the, you know, that's the easy thing to do. Uh, but, you know, in the words of a, of a great leader and, and president who grew up not too far from here, uh, you know, we choose to do these things not because they are easy, but because they are hard. Uh, because that goal will serve to organize and measure the best of our energies and skills, because that challenge is one that we are willing to accept, one we are unwilling to postpone, and one we intend to win. Right, the work of justice in any form is, is, is pretty hard, right? I know it and I think you all know it as well. Uh, you know, especially when we're talking about needing to change uh, laws and, and policies, uh, which really means, right, we need to change the minds of our decision makers, our political and, and, and elected and appointing uh, decision makers, right? Because we're talking about changing uh, longstanding, oftentimes governmental institutions where injustices are systemic and uh, as longstanding as those institutions uh, themselves. Uh, but I think, you know, you all being here today in this room and, and, and showing up on, online as well, um, you know, it, it shows that, uh, you know, you all are, are particularly interested in addressing these issues and, and tackling uh, injustice head on, right? It, it shows that it's a challenge that you all are willing to accept and one which you intend uh, to win. Uh, and because of that, I do consider it a, a great honor to, uh, you know, have been invited to deliver this year's, uh, you know, public lecture and to serve as, uh, you know, this year's Rappaport Senior Fellow in Residence. So thank you. Um, so getting into it, like unlike uh, many environmentalists, I didn't grow up with a love for the environment. 
And I, you know, I say this to folks all the time. Uh, and I know that that sounds weird, but if you'll you know let me explain, right? I didn't grow up with access to uh, cultivated environmental and natural resources that would have made me like want to grow up and be somebody who defended and protected the environment. Um, you know, I grew up in Detroit, like actually in the city, uh, and still live there today. Uh, still live in the city, um, and it remains, you know, the blackest city in America, uh, with about eighty percent of its residents identifying as black or African American. Um, you know, and I grew up there in the eighties and nineties at a time where uh, we really begin to see uh, the the dire implications of white flight from the city from the sixties and seventies. Uh, in, in 80s, right? And these were economic implications which led to the city of Detroit uh, filing for bankruptcy in 2013, right? The, the largest U.S. Uh, bankruptcy of, of, a, of a municipality uh, in history. Uh, you know, they, they claim to be about $20 billion uh, in debt, right? And, and arriving, uh, you know, to that bankruptcy didn't happen overnight, right? It played out over the course of, of decades. And, and I can vividly recall uh, what it looked like in real time as a child growing up in Detroit, right? And of course, as a kid, like I didn't really fully understand what was going on, uh, but I can kind of tell you what I recall and what it looked like to me in, in real time. Uh, you know, city services began to be cut like one after another. Um, you know, weekly trash pickup became irregular when it snowed and you know, places uh, like, like Michigan and Detroit gets a lot of snow when it snowed. Uh, our street no longer like was plowed. Uh, and, and, and one thing I remember as well was like as, as street lights went out, you know, street lights on, on, on the block that light up the block, when they went out, uh, they were not replaced, right? And, and I remember that particularly because one of the few street lights on my street wasn't directly in front of our house. So when it went out, you know, you would go months or years without you know, lights being replaced. We're talking about living on a dark, essentially a dark street, uh, you know, for the most part. Uh, but what stands out to me the most is uh, the city, uh, stop maintaining the, the kind of the two parks, public parks, like in my in my neighborhood. Uh, you know, one park was a big green space that had a huge hill and at the foot of the hill was a, a big kind of yard uh, where we played like football with the neighborhood kids and in winter time, uh, you know, we, we took our sleds and we sled down that hill. It was in walking distance, maybe about two blocks from, from my home. Uh, the other park right, was a little bigger. It, it had a basketball court, it had swings, monkey bars, kind of play, play sets and, and equipment, as well as a big field where you could uh, kind of engage in, in, in sports and other activities. Uh, by the time I was probably like nine or 10 years old, the city divested in those parks, um, just like they have with other kind of city services. And, and those parks became like a dilapidated, kind of rodent infested nuisance in our, in our neighborhood. Uh, and, and more importantly, what I realized is that it took away kind of the only uh, intentional exposure to uh, the outdoor environment as a form of recreation for me. Uh, and related to recreation, I think the other thing I remember uh, was growing up in a place surrounded by water uh, and not having meaningful access to it. Uh, and when many people think of Michigan, right, they think of the Great Lakes, right, the largest uh, freshwater uh, body in the world, uh, you know, chain of lakes in the world. Uh, and more than that, like Detroit uh, sits on the banks of the Detroit River, a pretty large river which separates Detroit from, uh, from Canada, right, along, along the border. Um, and I can, I can probably count on one hand, like how many times I actually visited like the river, right, and, and actually utilized the river as a child. Um, and that's because it, it dawns on me that it wasn't like cultivated for the average Detroit resident to access for recreation. Um, you know, by that I mean, you know, as, as when you think of other major cities, including, you know, Boston, historically, bodies of water uh, were a source of recreation, uh, economic development, wildlife protection, preservation, conservation, and just kind of generally a, a meeting space for communities and, and people. Uh, and, and Detroit didn't cultivate the river that way until, uh, I'll say, the last five to seven years. Um, and, uh, and, and as I look at that and kind of reflect on that, uh, the recent investment in the river also kind of correlates with the increase um, of white population returning to Detroit, right? And in particular, uh, predominantly live downtown next to the river. Um, and the river walk, uh, you know, surprisingly was named the number one river walk in the country last year. And, and uh, I visited, I don't live too far from it. I go to it all the time, but that was just to give a little little context of, of kind of my disconnect from the, 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 the built environment, natural environment growing up 
Um, but water is more than, than just recreation, right? Water is, is life as, as far as I'm concerned, right? And, and it's easily the most essential natural resource that we have. Uh, yet according to the U.S. Water Alliance, more than 2 million Americans uh, in the U.S. don't have access to running water in their homes. Uh, nearly 60 million are exposed to contaminated water coming out of their tap. Uh, and an estimated one in 20 households have had their water shut off by their local water utility. Right? And that's about you know, 15 million people from a recent survey done by Food and Water Watch from a couple of years ago. You know, I, I think about water in terms of access. You know, part of that access is you know, who has it and who doesn't, uh, but also look at access from two other lenses, uh, safety, and security. Uh, and by safety, I mean, you know, if, if I have literal access to water in my home, is it actually safe to drink, right? It can be coming out of my tap, it can be running, but is it safe for me to drink? Is it gonna have implications on my, on my health? Um, you know, is it free from contamination? And by security, you know, I mean, you know, am I secure in access to that? Uh, can I afford it? Uh, do I have to limit my use of the water in my home to kind of measure my water bill? Um, you know, how likely am I to lose access to that water uh, at any given moment if I fall on financial hardships, which we see many Americans do uh, throughout the country every day. And I'll say the reason I think about water in these terms is because I know what it feels like to live in a home that had its water cut off. Right? I know what it feels like to not have access to water. Right? I grew up in a two-parent home. Uh, both of my parents worked full-time, and yet there were still times that we could not afford our water. Bill, right? Um, and I had to prioritize, you had to think about, you know, am I gonna pay gas? Am I gonna pay electric? Uh, am I gonna pay my mortgage? Um, yet uh, water always was, was kind of first on the chopping block when they were making that decision and navigating that. And that was because we knew we could make do with the mechanisms that we set up to ensure that we could still have access to water. And those mechanisms for my parents were uh, filling old jars, apple juice jars of water, putting them in the basement in the pantry, and that when our water got shut off and we knew it would be shut off and they couldn't pay the bill, you went downstairs, you grabbed those jars, you, know, you heated them up on the stove to bathe with, right? you used them to cook, to brush your teeth, and, and so on. Uh, and that was, you know, that was kind of the, the, the routine, right? And these apple juice bottles, and this, was, this, this is when apple juice came in a glass jar uh, up until like the 90s, right? So they had these old bottles in the 70s and 80s. Uh, and my parents still have these bottles in the basement uh, today in our pantry. Um, you know, this past fall, I actually did an interview with Group Media, uh, an international media outlet. And, and as I was telling them about this practice of when the water got cut off, what we would do, it's like they, they couldn't fully conceptualize what I was saying, right? So I said, I'll, I'll, I'll do this. How about we shoot the interview at my parents' house, the video portion of it at my parents' house? Uh, with my mom's permission, of course, I asked her, could I, could I come over and come to the basement? And, um, you know, we did. They, they met me over at my parents' house in Detroit, uh, and we shot this interview uh, in my parents' basement in front of the pantry with the pantry door open with all of these 30 year old bottles of, of water, right? That my parents had, had kept, uh, you know, over the years for that, for that. So, you know, when I say, uh, you know, I say all that to say the fight for, for clean water is personal to me because I know what it feels like to not have water, right? And, and uh, no one should ever have to deal with that, right? As, as far as I'm concerned, you know, water is a, uh, is a human right. However, the, the laws that are in place to ensure safe water don't coincide with my sentiments, right, that water is a, is a human right. The Safe Drinking Water Act is a law that's meant to make sure that our water is clean by the time it, it gets, uh, you know, to our tap and comes out of our tap. Um, uh, you know, and over 90% of U.S. water systems are governed by the Safe Drinking Water Act, right, as, as a regulator. Um, however, you know, some of those numbers that I had previously mentioned about who lacks access to water, um, you know, whose water is contaminated and, and, and how much people are paying for water shows that, um, you know, the, there are many issues that uh, the Safe Drinking Water Act should be governing, uh, but simply are, are not missing. What that means is that the current law as it exists, uh, you know, has, has failed to protect people. And as you can imagine, uh, that failure has disproportionately uh, impacted uh, vulnerable communities, particularly communities of color. Now, all you've, you know, all you've had to do these last few years was just kind of turn on the TV and see, like, what America's water crisis uh, looked like. Um, you know, we, we had a, a, a Flint water crisis, um, you know, which was followed by a Newark water crisis. 
So you had a Flint water crisis, which was followed by a Newark water crisis, which was followed by a Jackson water crisis this past winter, where the, the, the people of Jackson, Mississippi went over a month without access to actual water. Um, and that was followed by a Benton Harbor, Michigan water crisis, which is still playing out today, where residents still are not able to drink their water in their own bottled water. And this is, we're talking just west of Flint, Michigan, right? Uh, you know, a community with, with, without water. Uh, and countless communities across the country face the same issue. They just don't make the headlines for, for various reasons. Uh, but, you know, one thing that stands out to me in the midst of these, you know, kind of crises that I mentioned uh, is that these are all majority Black, lower income uh, cities, right? And I don't, I don't think that's by coincidence, by, by any means. Uh, and that isn't to say that wealthier, you know, white communities don't also face water issues, contamination issues, contamination issues because they do. We've seen this issue of PFAS popping up a lot more predominantly in, 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 in white communities as well. Um, uh, but the data shows that communities of color tend to face them at higher rates and are less likely to have those issues resolved. Uh, as, as noted in my intro today, you know, I've spent uh, the last few years before Earth Justice as a senior attorney uh, at the Natural Resources Defense Council on our Safe Water Initiative, which was our, you know, kind of our source to tap uh, drinking water team. Now, mainly working on Safe Drinking Water Act enforcement issues, as well as kind of advocacy and, and, and policy issues. And, and during my time there, I had a colleague named uh, Dr. Christy pullen fetnick who's now the Chief Science Officer at NRDC. Uh, produce a, a pretty remarkable report titled Water Down Justice, uh, which looked at the relationship between uh, social demographic characteristics and drinking water violations. Uh, and the report confirmed what we knew anecdotally, right, which was that certain communities uh, were experiencing drinking water violations at higher rates than other communities. And those communities tended to be communities of color, uh, low income communities, uh, areas with, with more non native English speakers. Uh, areas with more people living under crowded housing conditions, uh, and areas with more people that lack access to public transportation, or just transportation generally. Uh, and, and, and what I'm about to read is a direct quote uh, from the report regarding race being the most significant factor when determining where drinking water violations are taking place. This is a quote. Of all those factors studied, though, race had the strongest relationship to slow and inadequate enforcement of the law. In fact, Drinking water systems in places with the highest proportions of their population that were people of color tended to spend more time out of compliance with the law for more violations for more contaminants. On top of that, even when problems were identified and enforcement actions were taken, the problems remained uh, uncorrected despite these actions. And it was noted that communities in which drinking water violations and race intersected were found throughout the country, all over the country. Um, to break that up a little bit, right? To explain what I just, you know, what I just read, uh, communities of color experience drinking water violations at higher rates. Uh, they experience <laughs> more water violations for more contaminants, meaning multiple contaminants in their water, not just one particular contaminant. Uh, their water systems spent longer times out of compliance. And lastly, uh, which is, which is, which is pretty crazy to me. Uh, when problems were identified and government enforcement actions were taken, the problem still went unfixed, right? And when you think about that last one for a second, um, it's saying even when the regulatory body uh, takes enforcement action on a water utility in a community of color, that water utility is basically saying, we hear you, uh, but we aren't actually gonna do anything. We aren't gonna fix the issue. We aren't gonna stop serving people contaminated water. Um, and that's pretty like that's pretty asinine, right? To think about, right? And and, and the reality of, of how our country deals with this contamination is just that, right? What the data has shown, um, and that you know that water contamination includes issues of lead, which we you know see a lot, PFAS, which has been an emerging contaminant, um, cancer-causing toxins like PCBs and, and and other toxics in drinking water. And the other part of this water crisis that I mentioned, uh, you know, is, is, is that our country is facing the issue of water insecurity, right? which is defined as uh, the reliable availability of an acceptable quantity and quality of water for health, livelihoods, and production. Right? The thing about this definition is that it, it acknowledges that there is enough water, right? There's enough water to, to go around, but brings into this question of uh, quality of water. Uh, as I just talked about with contamination, as well as availability and quantity of water, which is basically about who can afford water 
how much of it can they afford? Uh, and is that access uninhibited? Right, and as you can guess, you know, my view by now, right, is, is that all people should have uninterrupted access to water at all times, regardless of income or ability to pay, right, full stop. Uh, and, and, and once again, uh, you know, this is not the case in America. Uh, and once again, you know, my, my hometown of Detroit kind of has served as uh, really a poster child for water insecurity. Uh, I mentioned this, the bankruptcy that was, was filed in 2013. Uh, the year after that, the city decided, decided to generate uh, more revenue and get back on track by uh, calling in its water debts, right? Essentially, if you were late on a water bill, your debt was called in. If not, uh, you know, if you weren't able to pay it, you were shut off. Uh, that summer, uh, Detroit initiated the largest residential water shutoff in U.S. history. Um, and it shut off 44,000 homes in a year. 44,000 homes were shut off from water in one year. Uh, I think a, a couple years later, uh, I think another 17 or 18,000 were shut off. Uh, the, the ACLU of Michigan stepped in uh, to kind of highlight this issue and file a lawsuit, which, uh, though unsuccessful, drew a lot of attention to it. It drew the attention of the United Nations. Uh, which declared this uh, a human rights violation. Uh, and at this time, right, Detroiters were paying some of the highest water bills in the country and uh, were, were coming from under uh, a, a legally enforceable federal court order to subsidize uh, the rates of, of, of wealthier white suburbs. Um, Detroiters were literally covering 83% of operations while uh, suburban customers were covering 17%. You know, and and, and you know, again, at, at the climax of the Flint water crisis as well, it was later revealed that residents were paying the highest water bills in the country. So the Flint water crisis, in the midst of that, their residents were paying the highest water bills in the country, like number one highest. Um, right? the, the, the average Flint home was paying nearly $900 for water per year. Um, that was double the national cost of average. Right? And they were paying that for poison water. But when you when you think about that, um, you know there, there's kind of a common number that water should exceed uh, more than three percent of your household income, right? And that even feels kind of high. That's a debatable number, but that's kind of the general number given. Flint residents were paying about seven percent per year for water, contaminated water at that, right? And and again, I, I leave with these anecdotal stories to make them personal, but the data also backs this up as well. Uh, the NAACP Legal Defense and Education Fund. You know, did a study on this issue of water security. Uh, the report was titled Water Color, Study of Race and the Water Affordability Crisis in America's Cities. Uh, and it was re released in uh, 2019. And it looked at what was called America's Water Affordability Crisis uh, and the impacts that it had on low-income families, particularly uh, you know, Black communities. Uh, and the findings were similar to this NRDC study uh, that I mentioned. And one thing I'll note before getting into these findings uh, you know, is, is that the cost of water has doubled over the last decade, and in some communities it has even tripled. Um, uh, it's risen faster than the cost of gas and the cost of groceries over the last two years. But with that, you know, the, the findings of the NAACP report, you know, were as follows. Uh, one, there was a clear connection between historic and racial segregation and housing and access to water. Um, black families were more likely to lose their homes and suffer from health risks related to lack of water. Uh, service disconnections were rampant, right? Homes were getting shut off at, at much higher rates. Uh, black homeowners were more likely to have a water lien placed on their property when they were late for paying their bills, uh, which then assessed on your property tax and results in a tax foreclosure. So this happens all over the country, right? And what I'm saying is, I'm not able to pay my bill and I'm late on it. What some municipalities will do is then attach to my bill, which I already can't pay, to my tax, my, my property tax which if I'm having trouble paying my bill, I may, I'm probably likely having trouble paying my property taxes too. I go long enough without paying that property tax in full, the, the, the government forecloses on my home and then sells it in a tax, in a tax foreclosure, in a tax auction, right? Like that, that, that's a real thing, like that happens because you can't pay your, you know, your, your water bill. Uh, you, you know, the, the remaining two points of that report were, um, you know, black families were more likely to lose their family uh, in many states, the lack of running water in the home is a factor when determining a parent's fitness to actually keep your child, right? When you're dealing with child protective services, if you have no running water, that's a factor. Uh, and lastly, uh, criminalization was a factor. 
Uh, in many places, it's, it's a crime to turn your water back on uh, after it's turned off. So when you shut it off, some people know how to turn it back on. People are pretty, pretty clever. Um, and in some places, that's an actual felony, right? With with with, with jail time and, and high fines. Um, and 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 about that, I'll say, you know, you, you may have heard this before, right? But it's expensive to be poor, right? It, it's it's very expensive. Uh, and lately, with the criminalization of being poor kind of taking place around the country, you see a lot of ordinances and, and state laws being being passed um, around homelessness. Um, you know, it makes it even harder, right? When you have those laws to compete against, it makes it even harder uh, to to you know to survive, let alone have access to the essentials that you need. Uh, you know, and as I wrap this up, I want to touch on two things briefly, and I'll, and I'll say briefly because I want to. I, I imagine these will come up as questions that I can address uh, more thoroughly. Uh, during the Q and A, but I want to touch on uh, just kind of briefly, you know, why it is that you know we're facing this crisis, uh, and just some simple solutions. And, and I'll oversimplify these for the you know, for the sake of time. Uh, so the problem, right? This problem with with water in America, uh, a few different points. One, you know, it's due to our failing infrastructure. Uh, the the society, American Society of Civil Engineers, uh, gave America's uh, infrastructure a grade of a C minus in its most recent. For what it's worth, that's up from a D minus from a, from a few years ago. Uh, rising water rates obviously is a part of this problem. Uh, privatization of of uh, water systems, which tends to lead to uh, higher prices, as well as as water pricing is going up, and that's because water was either either underpriced for for too long. Now water systems are trying to make up for it for overcharging uh, for water. Uh, and just a, a, a few solutions are, uh, you know, stronger, more protective rules at this federal and state level, uh, transparency and required reporting uh, on certain uh, consumer measures. Uh, I say this all the time, like it's different. It's, it's always been difficult for me to do my job if I don't have the data, right? Because a lot of decision makers want to see the data that shows that this is an actual problem. But if my water utility, right, is required to uh, produce certain information, I then have to FOIA it, and if they're able to redact information or tell me a FOIA costs twenty thousand dollars, it's hard for me to do that, right? So making this uh, making transparency and water laws a priority, and then lastly, uh, you know, rate reform, right? Uh, there are studies taking place throughout the country. Many states are starting the issue around uh, water cost and water affordability in their state for the purpose of reforming it. We've seen a lot of assistance programs pop up and, and new affordability programs popping up. But um, you know, overall reform as it relates to the cost of water. You know, in closing, I'll say this: right, water seen uh, as a commodity to be bought and sold, right? but it, it shouldn't be seen that way, right? It shouldn't be uh, commodified and monetized in the way that it is, you know, here in, in the United States. Uh, you know, and we've been paying for it for so long, like it's easy to forget that water is a natural resource in abundance that's necessary to sustain life. Uh, and then with that, you know, I, I think it should be available and accessible in its cleanest form to all people. Thank you and looking forward to taking your questions. Questions? I think it's on. Uh, thank you for that uh, really interesting and great talk. Um, I'm curious, there's been a lot of, you know, I've been reading in the news about uh, the recent infrastructure bill passed and people say that some of the money is going to be used to maybe help solve some of the issues that you're talking about. Wondering what you think about uh, the recent infrastructure bill and uh, what it addresses and what it doesn't and, and what you think. It yeah, sure thing. So the, with the recent infrastructure bill, we saw the, the a historic investment in infrastructure, in particular in water, the largest investment and drinking water infrastructure that that the country's ever seen, right? If you had said, you know, a, a few years ago that we'd be able to get a, a, a couple of billion dollars for water infrastructure, uh, you know, we'd be excited, right? We, I think we got nearly maybe 45 for lead alone and uh, more than that for, for water infrastructure. So I, I think the, the, the bipartisan infrastructure bill um, gets to the heart, begins to get to the heart of, of America's water crisis because Infrastructure is infrastructure is considered the, the number one factor in that you know cost of water and contamination because our infrastructure is failing. How do we you know pay for that infrastructure other than raising rates and raising taxes on people who already can't afford it, right? To fix a failing infrastructure that's hundred years old and should have been fixed decades ago. So 
uh, my hope is, is that those dollars make it to where that they're supposed to go uh, and that the community's hardest hit um, who need those infrastructure dollars to be put to work immediately. Like they're, they're, they're put to work immediately, but I, I think, you know, the infrastructure bill uh, is a step, a, a huge step in the right direction to address this issue of particularly our, our crumbling water infrastructure, especially land and drinking water infrastructure that, that's outdated and, and should have been taken out of the ground years ago. Thank you. Hi. Okay. Um, you mentioned rate reform. Can you kind of speak more to what an equitable rate reform might, might be? Yeah. So, so there are a, a number of different ways to, to look at it, right? And I, and I think whatever happens, I always start by saying this whatever rate reforms take place, they need to coincide with what I believe is, is shut off moratoriums. Right, so whatever comes up, you, there needs to be a guarantee on the front end that says, okay, we're not going to shut off your water, and then uh, a reform that coincides with that. Because what's been happening is you've been shutting off people's water, and you're not getting any money, right? And, and it's my belief, if people were paying a reasonable amount that was affordable, whether it was tied to their income, right, to, to some extent, um, you know, it would, you would get something, right? We're talking about communities and water utilities getting nothing because you're shutting people off, right? So... Uh, a couple of ways to look at it. I'd say, you know, rate reform in terms of uh, should my water bill be attached directly to my income, right? Uh, should it be uh, attached to some level of, uh, you know, consumption, right? But but reduced, right? Maybe based on on, on the, the class of, of customer that you fall into. Uh, and essentially, you know, looking at, um, you know, one, you know, just people's ability to pay and not restricting consumption. Like one thing we've, we've, we've seen kicked around is, uh, flow restrictors, which is we won't shut you off, but we'll we'll slowly limit your access to water as as one sort of reform. Uh, which to me, like I don't, you know, I'm I'm not a fan of right the, the idea of kind of limiting people's access to a resource in their home. But I think there are a few different ways to kind of look at the reform. But what but whatever the option is, it, it has to take into account that um, the way we pay for water now is inequitable, right? And in some communities that I've worked in, uh, water. You kind of price your water in a couple of different ways. If you have a meter on your home, you can see how much water is coming into your home and you get an accurate reading. Right? You may still be charged more than you should be paying for water, but at least you know how much water you can use. What we've seen in other places is that water is not metered. Like if your home is a meter, I'm getting charged an estimate of what the water utility thinks I use, which is almost always higher than what I than what I actually use. So when we think about reform, also thinking about the technology that goes into ensuring accuracy and accounting for how much I should be paying for water. Thank you so much, Jeremy. That was really insightful. I, I'm, of your three proposals, I'm wondering, um, are they state reforms or federal reforms? So this is this is the federalism question. What can the federal government do other than throw money at the states? And where does the state, the state water act, I think you, you called it, where does it fall short? Yeah, yeah. So I, I think from the from the federal level, uh, I think the reforms for contamination in particular, right? They 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 need to be strong at both the state and federal level. Uh, but what we know is that, uh, like the Safe Drinking Water Act, uh, you know, hasn't been uh, revisited right in a really long time. Right now, we have the the lead copper rule, which is uh, deals with contamination at the federal level that's now being revised, uh, you know, to some extent to to begin to tackle it. So part of that is like putting the rules in place to deal with contamination. I think from the, from the standpoint of, you know, state levels, we have seen state step up and actually implement rules that are stronger than our federal rules, one, because they have the power to, and also because they realize it's necessary to protect the health of their residents. I mean, we, you know, we saw this happen in the, in the wake of the Flint water crisis, and that the state of Michigan passed a Safe Drinking Water Act rule, uh, lead and copper rule that was stronger than the existing federal one, which now the federal one is being revised because you can't look at the state and say, okay, they're, they're, blowing us out of the water and the data and the science is there. So from a contamination standpoint, I think it needs to come from federal and state level because what states typically do is, you know, I'm going to default to uh, the weakest standard to allow water utilities or, or corporations to kind of skate by and, and not have to do much. From the affordability standpoint, um, I, I think, it, it again, it, it needs to happen at both. But to your point, I think there needs to be federal resources allocated to make sure that water systems can do assistance and affordability in a meaningful way. So one thing we saw, especially over the last couple of years during the pandemic, uh, money that's never been issued before has been issued for water assistance, right? To allow, um, essentially allow 
uh, you know, water utilities to not shut you off, right? And, and, and the federal government is essentially allocating funds to reimburse you. So I think there is, from an affordability standpoint, there is space there, but uh, I think it's going to take off, right? I think, especially when we talk about infrastructure upgrades, it's, it's going to require state and federal dollars combined uh, in, the, in, the, in the workforce, skilled workforce to do it. So I think, oh, that'll be one's more important than the other. One question here, and then we're going to go to some on the and then we'll come back to you. Oh, Mr. Orr, thank you very much for uh, your presentation on this important work. Uh, my question is, uh, if you could maybe elaborate on your thoughts on uh, rain capture systems. Um, and I just did a quick search on what the average water use per gallon is in the United States. And it says approximately 60 gallons. Um, now I've set up a, a two barrel rain system at my house. Um, and you know, my father actually did similar practices what you did and uh, your parents did in terms of conserving the water. But you know, what are your thoughts on how individuals could try to harvest rainwater as an alternative to water use in the home? Yeah, I, I think that's by the way. We, we've seen, um, especially when we start getting into kind of green infrastructure issues as well, right? The, the creative ways to capture and reuse water. But, but what you're referring to is, is, is it's the, the mechanism that overburdened communities have been using for decades, if not centuries, to cope with insecurity right of of my water system not supplying me the water either the clean water or the amount of water that i need um so when you think about things like kind of rain barrel system you know i i i've, I've always liked the idea of, of and I've, I've worked at a company that ended up implementing that within our um, within our physical building like we were capturing rain in, in, in rain barrels so I, I i one i like the idea two i think also you know you know you get into the space of like should should I have like should I have to do that, right? Like as 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 as, as someone who, who who lives here, someone who, who you know owns a home, someone who's paying a water bill, right? Astronomical rates. Like should I have to get into finding these creative ways to have to you know have to collect water and, and reutilize it? Like I don't I don't think so, right? I, I think it's intuitive. I think it's great, but also. Like, why is it necessary to even have to do it? It's one thing if it's an option, right? And, and, and you're being sustainability conscious, environmentally conscious, in addition to your water use. But it's another thing when it's quite literally the only option I have because I don't have access to water. So I think those types of ideas are intuitive and, and creative and can be helpful, especially in emergency situations. But like that shouldn't be like that shouldn't be the norm. You know, it shouldn't be forced on on folks who can't afford water, pay for water as as a norm. And we've seen, you know, I've seen, I've, I've talked about this to, with, with some colleagues uh, uh, not too long ago, but, you know, it's the collection of whether it's the rain barrels, whether it's the jars, right? We, we've seen, I've, I've seen in, in my upbringing, connecting to other people's water system, right? We've seen water hoses, you know, used throughout neighborhoods. But like once you start getting into those things as a necessity, it begs the problem of, okay, let's, let's get to the root of the issue of why people have to do this to begin with. We have a quite a handful of questions online, but I'll start with this. Is there a benefit to a rights discourse around water in the US? You mentioned the UN human rights violation named in Detroit, and there have been big moves around the international recognition of the human right to water. That said, rights has also come under criticism as a progressive strategy that can backfire in the US. What is your view? Yeah, I, I think the rights conversation is absolutely necessary. But, but one thing we started to do at NRDC last year was move away from the, the idea of water as a human right and instead as a legally enforceable constitutional right. right? So there are many constitutions around the country, state constitutions that have environmental protections as a human right. And one, which I think is going to be really critical, um, is the state of New York. The state of New York passed an environmental uh, constitutional amendment uh, just this past election, I, I believe in November. Uh, and that constitutional amendment has a legally enforceable right to a, a few different protections, but including water, right? But what does that what does that look like, and what does that mean, right? If we're saying it, and we know it's legally constitutional, I can take this to court. Like, what does that mean? And I think that's what's what, what's going to be playing out over the next couple of years, as, as you know, in terms of um, in terms of that right. But I but I think like the conversation around the right uh, is absolutely necessary, right? Whether it's a human right. Whether it's a constitutional amendment, constitutional right, uh, there needs to be some rights that are legally enforceable, um, you know, to 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 be able to say that people have access to the environmental protection and public health resources that that they need. And I think water is absolutely one that you know that 
should continue to have discourse around being a, an established right. This person asks, just want to say that your work have, you've done in Chicago and other areas is phenomenal, um, but they want to consider what's the greatest barrier in addressing water inequality in this country. And I want to add to that, can you speak a little bit more work? Because I know this is the work you've done when you were at NRDC with the city of Chicago. It would be nice for everyone else to know a little bit too about. Yeah, yeah sure thing. Thank you to, to, to that person for acknowledging that work. I, I think the, 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 the reason that work was successful was because it was community center, right? We had so many different stakeholders environmental justice, um, you know, planning organizations, uh, municipalities. We even work with, with water systems and utilities uh, on these issues. And, and one you know, piece in particular, which I think I'm most proud of, I work on a number of issues in Chicago and Illinois. Uh, but last year we passed, uh, you know, the first state to pass through a legislature, uh, the mandatory replacement of all lead service lines in the state. Uh, Illinois had the most lead service lines of any state in the country. Uh, you know, uh, known to be 700, around 700,000, but estimated to be upwards of 1 million, potentially 1.2 million service lines far and away, right, from, from any other state, any other city. Chicago has 400,000 lead service lines far and away, the most of any city uh, in the country. Uh, and we were able to, uh, you know, collaborate and get this through the legislature with bipartisan support. Uh, Michigan mandated the, the removal of lead service lines through uh, administrative process, through rulemaking following uh, the beginning of the Flint water crisis. Uh, Illinois, the first state to pass it through an actual legislature with bipartisan support. I believe New Jersey, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, I think New Jersey later passed uh, something shortly after Illinois passed it. But that's that's one of the things we were able to work on and get passed in the state of Illinois, the replacement, you know, the replacement of all that service lines. I think the biggest barrier to, um, you know, two issues in particular of infrastructure is like who's responsible for paying for it. Right, like who's responsible for these upgrades? And a lot of times um, that burden almost always tends to fall on the homeowner, the resident, right, the taxpayers, but yet it, 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 it shouldn't, right? Especially when we're talking about failing infrastructure that, that, that we weren't responsible for, right? That, that we didn't ask to be installed in our communities or, or in our homes, especially toxic infrastructure. I think one of the biggest barriers is, is this conversation around cost, uh, in particular who pays for it, I think it's sometimes it's difficult for water utilities to step away from the idea of they're providing a service, right? That they're providing you with a commodity, right? And, and instead looking at it as, hey, this is something we should all have access to and we can work together in figuring out a solution. But the idea that we're just gonna uh, drop all of these financial cost responsibilities on uh, the individual homeowner or taxpayer, like it can't work. And I think that's one of the things that we were able to work through in Illinois on, on this particular bill and a number of, of other issues, which is having all the stakeholders at the table to say, okay, these are, this is what I want, right? This is what you want. Let's figure out a way to meet in the middle and, and get this right. Cindy, we're going to do one more here and then you can go back to the room. Hello, Ms. Dora. Um, I have two questions that kind of related. The first one, I, I'm from Florida and one of our water processing plants was hacked. And what happened was the hacker increased the concentration of sodium hydroxide, basically poisoning the water supply. So the first question I have is, are our water supplies currently safe from cyber intrusions? And is that something that we might need to look forward to more? The second question is, um, are there differences in the rates charged by publicly owned water companies versus private water companies? And is there, is it feasible to completely squeeze out privately owned water companies or is there always going to be a place for them? So to so the first question, no, right? Our, our water is, is our security of our water system from, from a technological standpoint, it's not safe, right? Because what you mentioned has happened, but it's also happened before, right? It's happened on occasion. Like where people were able to hack into the water system. And I had a colleague at NRDC, uh, Eric Olson, who's a, who's a phenomenal, uh, you know, safe drinking water act, uh, expert. Uh, you know, he, like he, he would say this, right. He had been saying this, which is like, we aren't safe from, from, you know, from attacks, right. Virtual attacks. And, and we've seen it happen. So the short answer there is no, and more needs to be done to enhance security around uh, protecting our water from, from these types of hacks. And I'll say the, the other, um, you know, the other question uh, being private versus public. Yeah, private versus public. Yep. Yeah. So the uh, what we do know is is 
private utilities, water utilities tend to have higher rates. Uh, but one thing I've also seen right in, in some of the data is that private utilities tend to have less violations too, right? I, I think that which is which is surprising to have less violations, but and they're all used to governed by the, the, the Safe Drinking Water Act. But the idea of, of I think phasing out uh, you know uh, private water utilities all together probably uh, probably not realistic, right? And, and I think that because there are communities that actually need them, right? Especially when we look around the south, right? When we look out west, right? There are communities, even EJ communities, that may prefer uh, to have a private water system, right? Or, or 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 if not private, a consolidated water system, uh, you know that 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 has a bit more a bit more attached to it, uh, just out of out of necessity. But I think like the result of you know water contamination and fixing like the the result shouldn't be like the default shouldn't be let's just privatize it right because that always seems to be the default right like let's let's privatize it and and you know that'll that'll fix the problem and we know that that doesn't work so um i think there are you know potentially some benefits to existing um you know private utilities uh, but you know my, my take is is uh, we shouldn't just default to, to switching the privatization We have a question about the nexus of water insecurity and fresh food insecurity. Um, she was just wondering about your thoughts on those connection and said, I'm excited to see support for urban community gardens, but see water availability as a largely prohibitive factor. Rain bearers help, but can run out during hot spells. Is that a fair read? And just interested in hearing your thoughts. Yeah, I mean, I think the two are directly connected, right? Because at the end of the day, we're still talking about, you know, uh, resources that are essential for our health and well-being and survival, right? We're talking about food and water. And a lot, a lot of times you look around at different kind of advocacy programs and, and, and the food and water teams are one team, right? The advocacy they're doing is connected because they know there's uh, an, an overlap there. In particular, when we're thinking of, uh, issues of, of urban gardening and, and, and urban farming and, and the connection to water. Uh, you know, these these uh, efforts in particular around food are popping up in communities that tend to be food deserts, right? That, that tend to not have grocery stores, that tend to have a, a shortage of fresh produce, which also tends to be the communities that uh, are suffering drinking water violations at higher rates, uh, communities that are uh, struggling to pay, uh, you know, their, their drinking water bills. And I don't, I don't think that's by coincidence that uh, you know, certain overburdened communities are facing both water issues and food access issues. So the idea of, of um, you know, again, you know, kind of continuing to, to work on, on these issues of, of being able to sustain, self-sustaining, right, as it relates to food and water are important, and there is a overlap for sure. Yeah, that's nice. Sure. Thank you very much for joining us today. It's really a privilege to have you here. Um, particularly since there are, you have law students here who are launching their careers, I was wondering if you had reflections on two issues. The first is dealing with difficult times such as the Trump administration. Is there any uh, learning on your part uh, as a public interest lawyer from uh, from a difficult political environment, shall we say, as in Trump. And also, secondly, do you have any reflections on what it's like to be a public interest lawyer uh, and what the rewards are, what sort of preparation, uh, what sort of uh, career path, how you took the path that you have taken to get where you are now? Thanks. Yeah, really, really good question. Uh, and, I, and I've been saying this, when, when Trump got elected, it, like it made everybody pivot because people were sure like Clinton would get elected, right? So everybody spent two years creating you know, in a, a progressive agenda that they were going they were going to be ready to hit the ground running once once um, uh, Secretary Clinton got in office, and that didn't happen, right? And people were like organizations and institutions, advocacy organizations were flabbergasted for months, right? Because you spent all this time getting ready to move this agenda that is going nowhere, right? And it took it took organizations a long time to figure out like what were we going to do, right? Like what's our what's our next move? And it became pretty clear our next move was to hold the line and defend 
right, protections, you know, across the board as they exist, right? Because we've seen a lot of rollbacks. So we're just not talking about environmental issues. We've seen kind of attacks on, on a number of, of uh, civil rights and, and human rights and environmental protection, social protections, and so on uh, under that administration. And what I, you know, what I've said to folks a lot is that uh, there was no shortage of work over that last four years, right? There was always something to do. And institutions actually saw bumps, right? We saw a lot of advocacy organizations, public interest organizations get bumped up, right? We've seen the ACLUs and the NRDCs and those type of NAACPs get uh, double, right? Double in size and, and, and double in budget because, you know, people knew that it would be necessary to defend, you know, some of the laws and the rights that we did have on the books. Uh, it was absolutely difficult. Right, it was actually, especially in the environmental realm, where you know you had you know two different administrators whose sole purpose really felt like to uh, disband the EPA, right, and, and, and kind of roll back environmental protections across the board. Uh, so to be in a position to be able to uh, you know be at a place like NRDC at the time and, and fight and win for protections of so many different uh, environmental uh, laws and rules was was I, I enjoyed it and, and really uh, appreciated the place that I was in, even though it would have been great. To move the ball further on environmental justice, right, and further on sustainability, and further on climate change, just being in the space to even, you know, uphold what we had to better set us up down the line was was really was really helpful. And then, two, just kind of brief reflections on on working in the field of public interest. Um, you know, it for for me, I guess what I'm passionate about, right? I think it makes a difference when you do what you love and, and do what you're passionate about, uh, and and do what you care about. Like I, I go home every day. And feel like like I'm making a difference, and that isn't to say you don't feel that with any other career, right? And, and private sector either, right? I just know like what matters to me, and like making a difference in the lives of people and communities matters to me. So like the realm of public interest across the board, which I've predominantly worked in that space uh, my entire career, has kind of given me that feeling and, and um, sense of, of purpose. So, uh, but again, you know, as, as kind of alluded to, like it's not easy, right? It's not easy. Right. A lot of times organizations are under-resourced uh, and overburdened, right? And you're taking on a lot of work, you know, big caseloads, um, work with communities without a lot of resources. So uh, it's a lot of work. But if it's something, you know, that, that you're passionate about, I'll say it's certainly well worthwhile. And I know it has been for me. Okay, I think we're out of time. So let me just thank you very much. <laughs> Coming. Thank Jeremy for a talk that was enlightening, inspiring, uh, depressing. <laughs> um, Jeremy will be here for a couple of days if people want to meet with him, particularly our students. So please contact us through the Rappaport Center. Um, I'll just close with a thought that occurred to me as I was sitting there. I think it was the novelist Kurt Vonnegut who wrote once that um, humans were actually created by water as a way to move itself more efficiently from one place to another. So I would say on behalf of the water, <laughs> just thank you so much for your work and for visiting with us. Thank you.